Then, I suppose we should get started. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Steve Gallagher. I work on the Fedora server SIG. Uh, for the most part, I act as its chairperson. So, what are we going to talk about today? Uh, I'm going to go through why did we create the Fedora server? Uh, what, what is our ultimate goal with it? How are we getting there? And last but not least, where did we go so, so wrong? So let's start with a little bit of a history lesson. Uh, when, when Red Hat Linux was first uh, created, back in the days when I still had hair, there, it, it was very heavily driven by hobbyists and uh, Small and small server admins, people who wanted to get things done, people who wanted to support their engi their engineering uh, habits or their um, or, or their science labs and things like that. And over time, uh, as Linux and the open source community grew, and especially became Fedora and our Fedora community grew, it kind of started to uh, to morph. I'm getting off the camera. Uh, it kind of started to morph into a more heavy desktop focus. Uh, things like the GNOME project and the KDE project both started taking up all of the mind share of people who thought about a Linux distribution. They were thinking about, how do I use it to replace Windows? How do I use it to, uh, to, get, a better, uh, to get a good Unix experience without having to pay you know, thousands of dollars for a Mac? Things like that. And while this was happening, it started, to, it started to cause those longtime server admins to be kind of pushed aside. All of the new functionality, all of the new features, all of the cool new things we were doing, they were all in the desktop space. And it got to the point where server administrators were starting to become the party of no in the, uh, in the Linux community. They were kind of, it was kind of a matter of, they weren't getting an opportunity to innovate the way that they, uh, that they really should be. And what they were ultimately getting, getting to is, no, no, please, please don't make, uh, please don't open the firewall by default. Please don't do this. Please don't do that. It's bad for servers. It was about all they could manage to get through as far as changes in the Fedora project. So when we embarked upon the uh, Fedora.next program, uh, one of the things that I pitched at the time was that we should consider, and, and we ultimately did, uh, changing up our set of deliverables so that we had a few primary, uh, at the time we called them products, uh, that would be Fedora Workstation, which would focus very heavily on the desktop and uh, use cases, Fed uh, Fedora Cloud, which would handle th this, at the time, new and emerging uh, public and private cloud uh, environment, and the Fedora Server, whose goal would be essentially to really focus on the data center administrator of of our classic history. And uh, like I said, this, uh, as all of you know here, that idea took, uh, took wing. We did, we did uh, split these out. And so we built an environment where the server admins now had another voice. They had a place where they could say, hey, now that we've got this, uh, our own deliverable, here's some cool, cool things we can do that the desktop people would have said no about, or the desktop people wouldn't have cared about. And, we can, and we've started talking about some of that. And uh, one of the things we did there, um, we, 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 we came up with a few very specific uh, uh, programs that we started, uh, that we started to, produ uh, to produce. Sorry, I lost my place and I'm uh, catching up to myself. That uh, would, be, it would be heavily focused on improving the, uh, data, uh, the data center OS. Uh, things that would, we hoped, ultimately flow down into future versions of Red Hat Enterprise Linux uh, and, get a, and pick up that audience as well. So I'll get to some of the details on that in a moment. But what is the ultimate goal of the Fedora server uh, edition and the SIG? We debated this for a very long time. In, uh, when we were originally doing the, uh, we had a, we had a, a series of PRDs, a, a project, a product requirement documents that we submitted to the council a number of years ago uh, that described what exactly our goals would be. And we've revised them over time. And I think uh, the most recent revision of our vision statement is 
anyone should be able to confidently obtain, configure, and deploy software services that address their needs using readily available and trustworthy recipes. So that's a little wordy for a vision statement, but I think it's about as succinct as we can make it. What we want is for anyone, and I mean anyone, to be able to turn on a machine and with a minimum amount of, of education, figure out how to do uh, a common set of tasks. Uh, I want. Uh, I, I need a database server for my uh, for my house. I need. Uh, I want. I want a simple web server to show off uh, to show off my uh, my band's cool jams. And we really have never had that. Uh, the example I like to use is uh, Microsoft Windows. Uh, for all of its flaws, of which they are legion, uh, they did one thing very much right. When you install Windows Server, you log into it for the very first time. What happens is it comes up in a graphical environment and it brings up essentially a wizard. It gives you a list of things about this server. Here's its current status. Here is a, you know, here's a, here's a set of links to say, hey, here's some stuff you might want to do with this server. Click here and do it. You know what happens when you, when you install uh, a Fedora 19 server? and then you logged in, you got a blinking prompt. You know what happens if you type help at that prompt? You get the help for bash. Not for the OS, bash. This, is not a, this was not a user-friendly experience. So in Fedora, we, came, uh, we decided that we really needed to do better than that. We needed to find a way to make the experience better at the beginning for people, and so, Nowadays, even if you install a headless uh, Fedora server, uh, before login even, you will now be prompted with a login URL that you can choose to use instead of typing and logging in at the local console. And you'll get Cockpit. I'll jump ahead in my slides, but that's okay. Cockpit is really cool. Cockpit is very much, uh, among, uh, among many other things, Cockpit is our answer to that Windows uh, ser uh, Server Manager lo uh, login. At a quick glance on a cockpit, you get usage statistics. You get that you can find out if it's part of a domain, join it to a domain. You can change the networking configuration. You can change the uh, storage configuration. Uh, you can interact with Kubernetes in most in recent versions. You can. Uh, it has an SE Linux troubleshooter built in now, which is fantastic. We have uh, a lot of really cool features. Um, Include uh, we have uh, we can manage system D services. We can manage logs. Um, and we can do a lot of that from Cockpit. This was a huge step forward because we've now actually got a, uh, we've actually got a story we can tell that says, hey, it's not scary anymore. We can take this, and we can take this to a high school and say, hey, let's, try, uh, let's start teaching these students how to set up their own domains, how to set up, uh, data, how to set up a database. And they can start doing some of that. Without, uh, without a whole lot of prep work, a whole lot of understanding of how command lines work and what the hell VI is, and why do I have two OSs, one, call, uh, one called Fedora and one called Emacs. Uh, so, uh, a Cockpit has been a big piece of this, but um, we did, in fact, actually come up with a lot of uh, specific things that we wanted to fix. Now, as you can see here, it's very clear. You can, you can make out absolutely every bit of that, I'm sure. Um, what we did is we found a variety of different places where we had a poor user experience, a poor uh, ability to, for people to pick up and understand it. And we realized that effectively these came down to being what we decided for a time, for, at the time to call roles. It was uh, a series of things that we wanted the machine to be able to do, and we wanted to be able to set up a common, well, uh, you know, well thought out uh, security best practices way of doing it. So originally we came up with an idea called Rollkit, uh, which was a simple dbus service that was, was essentially a server oriented installer, a generalized installer. And we had a prototype that uh, was able to deploy two things. Uh, <laughs> it only it was able to install free IPA, which was really cool, 
Uh, it was one of the earliest times we were able to uh, hand a system to people and say, free IPA is, one is a one-line install, and it would it wouldn't do replicas. It wouldn't do uh, it wouldn't do AD interaction. In, uh, sorry, AD integration with with Active Directory, but it would give you a simple home office uh, domain that you could uh, that you could use, and just uh, and just get started with your with your own small uh, small business, for example. Um, the problem we had with Rollkit was it it was a bit too generic and it was also a bit too specific at the same time. It was, uh, it was a very generic uh, implementation of an installer. It was uh, simple, it was in Python, it was uh, easy, it was fairly, well, it was fairly complicated to, pl to cre create a plugin at the time. Uh, we had plans for how to make that much simpler. But at the end of the day, what happened is that we did not get the outside contributions we were expecting and hoping for. We did not get, uh, in, inside of Red Hat or outside of Red Hat, we did not get anyone writing server software that said, "Oh, let me help. How can I how can I write a Rollkit plugin so we can get that going?" And, and at the same time, we had a resource problem from the cockpit side, who decided that uh, who, who had just didn't have the uh, the cycles to uh, to try and implement the ones the roles we had already created in the UI. So what we ended up with was yet another command line tool that was really useful for only for two uh, for two servers. So as of right now, Rollkit remains on life support, mostly because it's still used in automation in, Fed in Fedora land for doing a lot of the uh, automated QA tests for release validation. But we are planning to retire it probably at this point in Fedora 28, uh, because I haven't had a chance to work with Adam yet to remove those from the, uh, from the QA environment. What we are going to replace them with, however, uh, is a new Ansible-based system uh, ma that that uh, Marius Volmer of the Cockpit Project has been working on, uh, and is trying to is, is trying to make a fairly generalized installer as well, but do it through an a through a series of Ansible uh, well-known Ansible scripts that are powered that are generated originally by Cockpit. Uh, uh, so it's going to be a Cockpit-originated project, which uh, has a, now a very wide and vibrant community. We'll have them. Create uh, create these models. Set up the uh, set up their dom the domain controller. Set up the uh, uh, the database server, and then apply it. But also be able to output an Ansible script that you can use if you want to recreate this or modify it. And, uh, and uh, instead, for instead of deploying it, be able to out output this and then throw it on a uh, point it at a cluster and say go or, and things like that. Load it into an Ansible tower and manage and manage an entire data center with this stuff. And it'll do the It'll, it'll help you pass that initial hurdle of learning how to use Ansible, but we'll be able to also provide a nice, simplified UI for, the, uh, for beginners, or for, uh, no, uh, for novices coming from another operating system who, wanted to do, uh, who want to get, uh, things wor get things working in Fedora Server. So that, I think, is going to be really interesting. It's still in its very early phases. And I'd love to hear. Uh, I'd love for anybody here who's interested in that uh, to join the Cockpit to Bell mailing list and speak uh, and uh, provide their feedback on what they would like to see from a user perspective, in particular. Because uh, right now, there's some uh, there's some user experience design going on. They have a they have a dedicated UXD person, uh, but there's not there's a lack of subject matter expertise in terms of uh, people who want to actually do those deployments. So if you've got any ideas on how that should look or feel or just want to contribute because it's a really cool project, I encourage you, please join the uh, Cockpit to Bell mailing list. Beyond that, uh, other things that we have worked on this year. I, I'm trying to remember. I think there was something. Oh, right, Boltron. So the other really big thing that we have worked on in Fedora Server this past year was we decided Given that, our, uh, given that we had kind of faltered on our original roles plan, we needed to find another place uh, that we could, uh, we could take the server that, uh, into its next stages. And with the modularity uh, uh, initiative going on, we realized that servers are one of those places where modularity feels most natural. Everybody wants to run their, th this really cool Node.js application, but they really don't want anything else in the OS to change. They want to make sure that they have the latest, they have Node.js 9.7, which doesn't exist yet, 
and they want to have uh, you know the latest li uh, NPM libraries, but they really don't want they, they really want a firm base uh, uh, to run it on. But then there's also the set of people that really, really, really want the latest uh, HTTPD, but they're okay running an old Node.js because their application was written by a contractor. They have no idea how it works, and they don't want it. To, uh, they don't want it to change for a couple of more years until they can uh, until they can hire a new contractor. Modularity allows us to address some of that too fast, too slow problem by allowing people to pick a, you know, pick a host that's fairly stable and then pull in whichever old or new versions of the frameworks they need to, uh, to actually run it. So we built a prototype that we called Voltron, and I have to give uh, credit where it is due. I don't know if uh, Steven Smugin is currently in the room, but uh, that, was, that was his uh, brainchild. We were kind of bike shedding on, on uh, project names, and we came up with, well, modularity, we've got a whole bunch of parts that are coming together into a greater whole, so that's kind of like Voltron, but we're also doing kind of a hacky job right now, so we'll, we'll say it's also kind of bolted on. So we came up with Voltron, and it's kind of stuck, and uh, I kind of hope it continues. I'm, I'm thinking maybe we rename it to the Voltron SIG. What do you guys think? Okay, uh, I, will, I will bring that up at the next meeting. So our next stages, our next steps there are, we, took, we have this prototype, it was functional, but not uh, shareable by any stretch of the imagination. And our goal in Fedora 27 and 28 is really to have this become, be put into shape such that we would retire our traditional legacy, uh, it, you know, one size fits nobody DVD, and go fully into this Voltron uh, inspired world. There's a lot left to be done with that. Uh, we need a lot of uh, composed pieces. I think we need, uh, we've, we've discovered that there are a few bits and pieces of the modularity, uh, like the module metadata that still need to be uh, updated to make sure that we have all the information we need to do things like set up end of lifes and figure out uh, which things are conflicting with other things. But I think Fedora 28 is a very realistic uh, date for that. I think that by the time we, I'm standing here at next year's flock, I think we will have uh, hopefully switched the server over entirely into being a modularized OS. All right, uh, that is pretty much the presentation I had prepared. So this is a good time for questions or suggestions on how we might actually accomplish these crazy ideas. And go. Is there a question there? So the question, uh, I, I, I'm going to rephrase the question. Um, so I, I think the real question there is, how does this differ from the alternative system? And the alternative system is really only designed to handle um, executables. It's really only designed to, hand, uh, to take uh, a couple of things that serve more or less exactly the same functions, that have, they take the same inputs and, and produce similar outputs. The modularity initiative is quite a lot more complicated than that. It's meant to be able to say, my application requires Python 3.6, or actually 3.6 is the standard one, but my application doesn't work because they made a backwards incompatible change. I must have Python 3.5. That's a much, much larger uh, spectrum of changes than just uh, swapping out an executable like send mail for, for XM or what have you. Uh, is that a sufficient answer, or do you have, uh, do you have a follow-up question there? Oh. Well, that's a bad, uh, I, I'm gonna uh, try to restate that and then disagree with it a little bit, but, right. So uh, what uh, Steven Smugin was saying is that uh, with alternatives, if you swap an alternative, the entire system sees that thing, whereas with modularity, uh, only this par portion of it would see that thing, and then the rest of the system would have its default. Uh, that is not true uh, in the case of modularity. That's okay. Um, 
what we are focusing on, I mean, that, that is an eventual goal, but uh, what we are focusing on right now is parallel availability, not parallel installability. Uh, in cases of things like Python, that's kind of a special case where, yes, you can do that, but we are, are trying to solve the general problem first where you, there are plenty of things that, uh, for which you can't actually co have them coexist. Um, what, uh, sorry. So, uh, you know what, uh, would you, uh, if you're going to go on, do you mind if I just hand you the mic for, so that I can get this on the recording? Thank you. Uh, so, what I tried to tell is um, an example here would be a, a factory that produces similar but not the same products. Let's say cars, uh, which or what? Or laptops, yeah. You you customize it according to, maybe not to down to a single order, but to different product lines where still keeping the same way of assembling them on the conveyor. Uh, here, uh, modules would represent a different type of components, but within each similar module, you would have enough differences that you would want to capture at the moment where you create this model. But then the conveyor stays the same whether you take module A or module B that represents your web server, regardless of what's inside, as long as they are consistent in expectations from other modules that would use these. So in the end, you would get an image, for example, if that's Docker or um, if that's installer image, you would get the same image with certain things tuned up. Maybe that's just a question of tuning up configuration files. Maybe adding some steps that only activated when you run this image first time. But from the conveyor point of view, all those modules are interchangeable. Yeah, I, I think that's actually a pretty good analogy. Um, yeah, but th this is only a first step. So effectively, right now, um, in Fedora project as a whole, only Fedora Infra and certain people are capable to change what on the conveyor can be built as Fedora image. We have alternative images and, and right. ISOs and so, but with the modularity um, concept at least, the goal would be that every Fedora contributor or user of Fedora contributed infrastructure would be able to build up their own conveyor mm -hmm. with enough configuration changes there that it suits for their use. Depending on whether this use is usable for others, I mean, <laughs> helpful to uh, solve others' problem, uh, these modules might be, might be published somewhere, right? But it also gives you ability to have people, projects, or companies doing enough tuning in their own versions of those modules, uh, yet, uh, not spreading out work on the actual infrastructure that combines these modules together. Right. Uh, another point to make to bring up uh, that's related is that what will uh, what will probably happen is we'll probably have a, a module or a small set of modules that will effectively be the platform that we still release on a f you know every six months type type of cycle, 
and then individual then the modules that go on top of that will likely be uh, it will have arbitrary versioning so we'll have things like here's the Node.js 8 stream and here's the Python 3.6 stream and within these streams you will all get all uh, all updates that are available in those streams but you won't ever uh, you know you won't have the classic Fedora problem of okay I go to Fedora 28 and all of a sudden I have Python 3.7 and half of my stuff doesn't work anymore um, you'll be able to stay on that until it's on, until it's a uh, previously stated end of life which is up to the packager to say up front I'm gonna I'm I'm willing to maintain this for two years or three years rather than six months or, n or 13 months, uh, in, you know, rather than 13 months in the Fedora schedule. Um, so it'll be, uh, so yeah, you'll be able, uh, it will be able to construct systems that you can swap out things like the base to get the newer kernels and what that and whatnot, but your, but your software stack that, it comp that compri uh, comprises your application that you care about will remain stable. Um, one moment to pass the I mic. I thought that description was really, really good. Um, and uh, I just wanted to add one more point that um, it is very similar to alternatives. It's also very similar to groups. It's also very similar to meta packages. It's also very similar to uh, like Python uh, and similar to software collections. Uh, basically, the, a lot of the point of modularity is also to make the concept a first class citizen of the OS. So instead of alternatives, which is kind of like an add-on and it solves one part of the use case problem, it solves one symptom, right? And software collections, which solves a different set of symptoms, um, the idea was that, all right, let's step back a bit and stop trying to solve all the symptoms and instead say, let's try to solve the problem. And then, you know, and then it enables things like you described. It enables potentially parallel installability down the road or enables parallel availability or it enables containers. But the idea is it, it's, not, it, it's not meant to be kind of the solution in and of itself as much as to say, let's go fix the actual problem which are causing all these symptoms which are then in turn being fixed. Okay. All right. Um, so we are actually at time. Uh, and I don't want to, I don't want to take up uh, the next uh, time slots uh, available time. So thank you everyone uh, for participating. Uh, I'll be at the back of the room if anybody wants to continue this discussion, but uh, unfortunately I do have to stop.